Um, well, it is 1.30, and we are going to jump into things. So the first thing that I would like to do is to welcome all of you to Gettysburg National Military Park. My name is Angie Atkinson, Supervisory Park Ranger here, and it is my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. So to that, um, Jeff Irwin, speaking today, is passionate about our nation's history and the stewardship of cultural resources managed by the federal government. As a professional archaeologist and cultural resource manager, Jeff has managed cultural resource programs across the country, from the U.S. Army at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, to the Department of Energy in the Upper Great Plains, the U.S. Navy at the Historic Naval Yard in Washington, D.C., and most recently, the U.S. Forest Service in the Sierra Nevada Mountains of California. His background includes extensive experience in archaeology, historic preservation, and Section 106 compliance, as well as archaeological and historical research, collections management, tribal relations, and more. Uh, our, uh, additionally, Steve Brand, who's speaking today, grew up in central Pennsylvania, coming to Gettysburg on a variety of school field trips and whenever family would visit from out of state. He has a BA in archaeology from the University of Pittsburgh and an MA in American Studies from Penn State University. He's been working in archaeology since 2003 and doing archaeological metal detecting since 2015. So welcome to both of these individuals and thank you for being here today as part of our winter lecture series. Just briefly, I'm going to take just a, a very short um, moment in time to uh, bring us into the little round top discussion. So as far as the, the background of what happened here, July 2nd, 1863, you have General George Meade, commander of the Union Army, bringing in about 95,000 men into this small town, and the Confederate Army bringing about 75,000 men. Now July 1, the, this meeting engagement, this, in a sense, non-planned engagement, will result in over 16,000 casualties, and General Robert E. Lee, commander of the Confederate forces, had not planned on an offensive attack. He, though, is propelled into one. And by the end of the day, has gained steam, has gained reinforcements from his army, and has pushed the Union Army off of the ridges on what we call the First Day's Battlefield, out in areas known today as Oak Hill, Oak Ridge, Seminary Ridge, had pushed them back through the town of Gettysburg <coughs> to some high ground known as Cemetery Hill. Now George Meade, um, who is just going to be soon arriving on the field late that night, early into the morning of July 2nd, has kind of got to come up with, with a plan. Um, he is new to command, three days in, at this point, and he needs to start assembling the battle line along the high ground, his ultimate goal to protect Washington, D.C. He assembles this, he gets these men um, arrayed for battle, and Lee's going to launch an attack on July 2nd after a number of plans, and this attack is mostly going to be to the south, the southern part of the field. And it's going to be toward an area, toward a high piece of ground, that the Union Army didn't quite occupy just yet, known as Little Round Top. Now, there were soldiers near it, there were some soldiers on it, but not really enough to you know, hold that down you know, in, in a truly defensive position, in a strategic defensive position. Lee is going to launch this attack on the south end of the field, um, headed up by James Longstreet. And the Union Army is going to be in a position where they need to quickly figure out how to deploy men onto that hill and get reinforcements there because that is a threat to not only the rear of the Union line and, and the men who are assembling there, but also the roadway to Washington, D.C., the capital uh, of the Union. So late in the afternoon as these attacks launch, Little Round Top becomes, you know, full in the sights of both armies. There are going to be Confederate forces that are aiming toward that hill, aiming toward that high ground. Uh, the Union Army will throw reinforcements upon that hill, one after the other, um, realizing the, the fragility of that position. And, you know, units that have gone down, and, and names that have gone down over time, Joshua Chamberlain, the 20th Maine, um, Patty O'Rourke, uh, Strong Vincent, a lot of these names that we are familiar with today become parts of history because of the intense fighting here. What remains of that fighting uh, over time that will help tell us the history of that fighting is what both Jeff and Steve are going to discuss today. 
So a critical point of battle, a critical moment in the Battle of Gettysburg, and a chance to kind of look at that moment from a very different perspective. So please welcome both Jeff and Steve. century, we get into a, a Civil War time frame, then archaeology is complementing uh, what we know already about something like uh, a Civil War <coughs> battle. A few concepts to take away and carry with you through this presentation. <clears throat> These are fundamental concepts in archaeology. I'll explain them and hopefully maybe we'll reiterate them as we go along or you'll, you'll think of them. Provenience. Provenience means essentially location. And that's location of a, a find of an artifact as recorded by the archaeologist. Uh, so it's a, it's a very specific, ideally sort of an absolute uh, measure. Now that can be two-dimensional in terms of something found on the surface, or it can be more three-dimensional if we're excavating and we want to record the depth, the relative depth, absolute depth. Uh, provenience is, is the information that we collect of the location of the artifact. This is critical because a lot of artifacts that we have, for example, in the collections here, do not, they lack provenience. We don't know exactly where they came from other than the battlefield itself. Association, this is a concept by which we, we attach meaning to artifacts. What is the artifact that you found associated with? Uh, what is it found with? Is it found with other, other artifacts of a contemporary or of the same age? Is it found with artifacts that are younger or older? Uh, is it found in an environment that's been altered? Or is it found in an environment that's relatively intact? That's how we begin to interpret artifacts and their meaning in relation to where we find them. 
And then context is that setting, is that immediate setting of the artifact, the environment in which they're found. We'll talk a little bit more about that with Little Round Top specifically. But it's that environment, whether it's uh, the surface of the ground, it's buried in the ground, it's on top of a ridge, uh, it's in a, uh, next to a stream that, that floods every spring. These are the, these are the context that we want to consider when we're talking about artifacts. Now, before we get into, I, I kind of divide this up. This is a, a little bit arbitrary, and um, certainly there's overlap between the two, but I'm going to characterize Gettysburg archaeology in, in two ways, farmstead archaeology and battlefield archaeology. Um, a lot of what we do in archaeology here is, is focused on farmsteads. There's at least a couple dozen farmsteads on the, farmstead sites on the park that do date to 1863. And much of the archaeology that's been done over the last 20, 30 years has been focused on individual farms or houses. Um, this is, you're seeing uh, trestle and, and rows here. Uh, most of this ex most of this archaeology is um, it's project driven, so we're assessing potential impacts to archaeological resources, and it's excavation based. Here you see a few examples of, of excavation in the lower left. This is uh, the uh, obligatory shovel test that is done in archaeology. It's just a, a means of discovery of, of subsurface materials. On the right, that's out at Benner House, a recent excavation that exposed a foundation. Uh, the upper left is what we call a profile, a soil profile. These are all done around uh, farmsteads. And again, we're focusing here on excavation. The, uh, the stratigraphy that you see up there in the upper left, this is a hand-drawn uh, cut profile of, of the soil. This is the kind of thing we're talking about with association and, and context, understanding artifacts, spatial relationship to one another and to their immediate environment. Uh, with farmstead archaeology, we do get a lot of artifacts. We get much more than we get out of the battlefield. Uh, the, the sort of refuse disposal, the trash disposal, um, dropping of artifacts around these farmsteads, uh, it, it produces substantial artifact counts in the hundreds or thousands sometimes when we excavate around these houses. And most of our excavations are small scale, but we still uh, get a fair number of, of artifacts. They're dominated by kitchen-related materials, dominated by a lot of ceramics, uh, a wide variety of ceramics, tablewares like you see here, um, as well as uh, redware, more utilitarian redware, uh, things like buttons that you see on the bottom, and then on the uh, upper right you see some personal items, you'll see uh, tobacco pipes, coin. Uh, one of the interesting finds there in the upper right is actually a prehistoric um, Native American dart point, which you might think of as an arrowhead. It's probably not an arrow tip, but uh, it's older than that. So there is evidence of that ancient past here too. <coughs> now in battlefield archaeology, uh, we're focused primarily not on excavation, but on metal detecting. And this is effective because, as has as been demonstrated across the country, and of course famously at uh, little, the Battle of Little Bighorn, uh, metal detecting can be uh, our best and kind of least intrusive, most productive <laughs> way of capturing some archaeological record of battle-related activities. A couple of shots of uh, fairly recent metal detecting on the park. What we encounter in these battlefield scenarios is primarily um, things like this. A lot of ammunition, um, and we'll, we'll show you some specific examples from Little Round Top in a few minutes. Uh, this, this bayonet is that's not a common find, but that, that was produced uh, a couple of years ago. And some other things that, that we find out on the, uh, the battlefield, many of which are related to the battle. For example, the <coughs> artillery uh, shell fragments below, the fuse, the shrapnel, uh, and then some, some other items which, which may be related or, or are related to the battle, including the, uh, 
these are percussion caps up there. Uh, there is a Spanish coin. Um, the the item on the upper left is actually post battle. It's a Hutchinson uh, bottle stopper. But um, we do get many artifacts that are are related to the battle itself. Now, that's not to say that's all we get. When you metal detect out there, you do get a lot of post battle or modern debris. So I'm not going to show you that stuff. <laughs> Archaeology really leans toward if you've read some of the, say, the Little Big Horn uh, material and, and other studies, it's it's really about distribution, artifact distribution, spatial relationships. Uh, back in the day, when they were doing Little Big Horn studies, it was pretty meticulous. They were having to sort of plot along with a, a survey instrument and literally sort of what we call piece plot every find within a grid that they that they superimposed on the ground. Uh, they did it in a, in a wonderfully accurate way, but it was extremely labor intensive compared to what we can do today. Uh, today we can use GPS, uh, accurate GPS, to locate individual finds across the landscape. And then we have mapping software like GIS that allows us to produce maps like this. So when we talk about battlefield archaeology, a lot of times we're going to be talking about this kind of information. <coughs> the spatial distribution of finds on the landscape and trying to relate those back to what we know about a particular uh, aspect of a battle. Uh, this is uh, the Devil's Kitchen area. This is a separate, I'm not going to go into this one, but uh, maybe we can have another talk about Devil's Kitchen, Devil's Den. Today we're going to focus on, on a little round top. But this is a, an example of some of the data that you can, you can generate and the types of maps you can generate. Okay, let's talk a little bit about Little Round Top. Um, everyone familiar with the rehabilitation project that's going on out there right now? Okay. Well, that's why we're doing archaeology. Um, this is uh, kind of a, a snapshot of the project itself, the rehabilitation plans. And as you are probably aware, uh, we're trying to address various issues, uh, sort of site attrition over the years in terms of social trails, erosion. Uh, we're trying to, to realign some trails, create some new trails, eliminate some problem areas, create accessibility out there, improve parking, vehicle, uh, uh, bus access, maybe install some gathering <coughs> areas, all these wonderful sorts of things. But all those wonderful things involve ground disturbance. Right. So uh, before we disturb the ground in a permanent way, we want to go out there, conduct some degree of archaeological sort of reconnaissance, if you will, to see what may <coughs> remain on the ground. And that's, that's, in essence, what is going on right now. The metal detecting that is happening is focused specifically on those areas of proposed ground disturbance. And this is, uh, this is representing, for the most part, those areas. Uh, here, let me try to, I apologize for the quality of this, but uh, you, see, you can see the battle action represented here. All right, You can see uh, some of the activity around Little Round Top uh, with your Confederate forces down here and the direct engagement here along sort of the uh, southwest portion of Little Round Top. Uh, What's, what's superimposed on this, this, this funny uh, polygon here, that is sort of our study area. That's what I put at the top, study area. Um, it's the project area. It's the overall project area that may be affected by the little round top rehabilitation. So importantly, when we talk about archaeology and patterns, patterns and spatial distribution, uh, we're not talking about everything out here. We're talking about only this area that we're focused on. We're not going outside of that area. And in reality, we're not even addressing this entire area. It's those areas of proposed ground disturbance that we're looking at. It's important because it creates a little bit of bias when you're, when you're looking at patterns, artifact patterns, and you see gaps. Well, those gaps could just be that we didn't go there. So um, that's, it's important to understand the sort of the sampling universe that we're, we're talking about. <coughs> 
Now, briefly, as I said, this is all preliminary. Uh, what Steve is, is working on right now is actually the third phase of archaeological work that's occurred in that little round top. And that data between those three phases is, is, is not married up very well right now. So we, we have quite a bit of work to do in putting all that data together. But just a glimpse of, of the kind of data that is being generated. I think this represents something like 900 uh, artifacts so far. And I created this table based on uh, an artifact type that these artifact types down here that constitute at least one percent of the assemblage. Okay, and then there's a bunch of them that are just one-offs or you know individual or a couple of, couple objects. Just to show you sort of what is being found out there in any substantial numbers, and you see right off the bat, ammunition is is by far the predominant uh, artifact type. Artillery comes in at a good strong third, but then there's this crazy nail category, uh, and we didn't necessarily expect that. I mean, some areas, on a farmstead you expect that. You get On farmsteads you get architectural evidence, but uh, you'll get brick, you'll get nails, window glass, stuff like that. But there's a lot of nails out at Little Round Top, and uh, we didn't necessarily expect that. Uh, but that goes back to, you know, try to think like an archaeologist, it goes back to context, it goes back to associations. Why are there nails there? What do, what do nails represent? Um, well, one little hint is the type of nail. And again, this is preliminary data, but there are basically three types of nails uh, over the continuum of the of American history, from colonial period into the 20th century. You have hand-wrought nails throughout the colonial period in the 1800s. Cut nails, machine cut nails, which are represented, the, the manufacturing process is represented. You all know cut nails are kind of those <coughs> triangular shaped, squarish head nails. Um, throughout the 1800s, and those years, those decades after the Civil War, cut nails are the common type of nails used. You get into the early 20th century, they're replaced by the wire nail that we all use today, the common round wire nail. But in that latter half of the 19th century, cut nails, well, that's predominantly what we're finding out there. Most of those nails at Little Round Top are cut nails. So what do they mean? Well, <clears throat> one thing they could mean, if you look at the, these are, this is a handful of the monuments that are out there. And these are the, the years when those monuments were erected. The years when those monuments were erected correspond well with cut nails, when cut nails were commonly used. So it could very well be that what we're seeing is some of that activity, evidence of that activity, uh, where uh, platforms are being erected, speaker platforms perhaps, uh, scaffoldings being erected when monuments are being installed, things like that. <clears throat> there was also a souvenir stand out there, right? And a lot of nails are being found down in that area. So, uh, but the point being, uh, it's not sort of a pristine, unaltered landscape. There's been a lot of activity out there over the decades. This is a, a partial look at some of the nails that have been found out there so far. <coughs> there are many more. One other little uh, story about sort of context and associations. Uh, this is the 44th New York Monument. And you all probably know this very well, the castle. See that shot on the, this is sort of the west side on the left. <clears throat> the image on the right was taken recently, and that's the monument on your right. It's, it's boarded up, as all of them are, to protect them during the project. <coughs> well, they, uh, the contractors dug a trench just in front of the, of the monument because the trail's going to be installed there. A new trail's going to be installed there. And when they excavated that, well, importantly, before they did that, up here, on the ground surface right in front of the monument, Steve did some metal detecting, and he found some artifacts, some battle-related artifacts. Uh, then they excavated this trench, which is fairly deep. And lo and behold, Steve jumped down to the trench and metal detected down there, and he found some artifacts down there. Now, 
should that be? Should you have artifacts up here and artifacts down there? Um, well, you do. So whether you should or not. <laughs> but uh, as, as far as we can surmise, uh, what we're looking at there, it's actually quite interesting. Uh, this is the this is the step leading into the, the castle right here. This is the the closest wall of the trench. This is the bottom of the trench. When we clean this off, what you see down here is this dark blackish soil. Okay, that appears to be an old what we call a horizon or a top soil. In other words, that's the old ground surface. That's the that's the ground that the soldier walked on. This is all this is all fill. This is all clay and a bunch of rock that was piled up when the monument was installed. Right. So this is a this is a mound that was created in order for the monument to be built. And down here is the original soil. So we excavated a portion of this, and we did find a few artifacts, not much, but we did find a handful of artifacts uh, that are clearly related to the battle. Now, so then the big question becomes, well, are these up here meaningful, or are they, how did they get there? Right. Um, answer that later. But that was a, that was a fun little exercise. And it's something, it's, it's something that we have to keep an eye out for here because this occurs at the farmsteads as well. Some of the best archaeological finds, that, what you might think of as like a little time capsule, is when you get a sealed deposit like this. It, inadvertently, but say at a farmstead you have a house that was built in the 1840s, uh, say there's an 1870s edition, and that edition was removed today. Well, the 1870s edition may be sealing whatever whatever predated it, right? So those are the types of things you want to look out for. Okay, well, I've set the stage, and I want to turn it over to Steve. This is a this is a map showing you uh, a fair amount of data, including some of the data that Steve's collected, and some of what we call the phase one of preliminary of earlier round of work that was done out of Little Round Top. <clears throat> and just to give you a sense of, of sort of how things look, this is all small arms ammunition and uh, evidence of artillery out there. And then I will turn it over to Steve, who's going to talk a little bit about what's some of the cool stuff. <laughs> contracted by the National Park Service to uh, metal detect and do the archaeology, uh, monitor the construction as they're moving through. Um, as they're removing the existing asphalt and uh, excavating areas for vegetation removal and revegetation, I've been moving along and metal detecting as they go. Uh, I'm going to show you some of the mainly ammunition that I've found. Uh, the, by far the majority is three ring mini balls. Uh, that would have been standard ammunition for the Union forces. Uh, all four of these we were found in one metal detecting <coughs> hit, um, and you can see on them the three rings, which would have held um, <coughs> the grease for ramming the, the, the bullet down the barrel of the rifle. These are also three ring mini balls. These are a little larger. These are 69 caliber. The other ones are 58. Um, These are what's known as a Gardner mini ball. They would have been the standard issue for the Confederate forces. Uh, the, 
basically the same rifle, basically the same <coughs> mini ball, just uh, they're different patent and a different uh, manufacturing. So they had two rings on them and a, a skirt that would have been swage down over the paper in the cartridge. Uh, this is a Williams cleaner ball that would have been uh, mainly issued to the northern forces. Uh, you can see on the bottom right there, there's a, a zinc disc that would have been um, held onto the the ball with a, a, a pin, and when the rifle was fired, that zinc would have expanded into the rifling of the barrel, and uh, as it moved through the, the barrel, it would have induced the spin of the round. And also cleaned the rifling in the barrel, which makes them called Williams Cleaner rounds. Very original. <coughs> this is a Sharps. Uh, you've heard a lot of, if you're familiar with the battle, you know that the sharpshooters played a big role there, the U.S. sharpshooters and the Confederate sharpshooters. Um, this was the round that they would have had. Uh, pretty much any time you find a sharps bullet, you know that it was related to the sharpshooters' units. This is kind of an overview of all the rounds. Uh, at the top are the three rings, that's the 58 and the 69, the Williams Cleaner and the Gardner. And this one would have been buck and ball. Uh, they would have been in together in the cartridge, uh, so they would have fired out as more of a shotgun effect. Uh, then the Sharps is next. And at the bottom here is a, an Enfield, which doesn't have any rings on it. Um, and then this last one, we're not really sure 100% what it is, but we think that it is a, a Dance and Park style mini ball that would have been produced by the Confederacy in Texas. And it was found uh, on the ridge top near the Governor Warren uh, statue. So it was probably fired from the Texas units coming up the hill towards the uh, Union. These are percussion caps. Uh, all of these were found together uh, on the near the 20th Main area. Um, they're not fired. Well, the one might be fired, but they're typically not fired. We don't find a lot of those at Gettysburg because they're so small and they're brass. So they don't hold up very well in the acidic soil. Uh, these are fired mini balls. Um, a three ring here and a gardener on this side, and you can see those rings. And that's how we know that they're fired. But we look at the fired rounds to see well, if, if there was a Confederate position here or a iron position here. We should see the fired three rings on the what would be the Union facing the side of the position, and vice versa for the um, Union forces on the top of the hill. If we find a lot of the Gardner uh, mini balls, we know that they were firing at that position. So another thing that we look for is evidence of the artillery that would have been up on uh, the top of Little Round Top. Uh, these are uh, friction primers. We found two of them uh, on the top near where Hazlitt's batteries would have been. Um, but that's really the only place that we've found them. So it makes sense because that's where we think the artillery was. They weren't right on the very top, though. They were a little below, which they usually are ejected whenever the cannon fires. <coughs> This is the base of an exploded uh, artillery shell that was found on the east side of the top of Little Round Top, kind of more towards the parking area than up on the very top, um, which probably means that it exploded over top and 
the fragments continue to the back side. These are more artillery fragments. Uh, you can see on them that they have the, um, this is where the fuse plug would have been mounted into. And here is the fuse plug that would have been right in the end of the shell and um, ignited when it was fired from the cannon. Um, that's the only fuse that we've found so far. We found fragments, but this is the only intact one. And it has exploded. This is a gun tool. It would have been carried by the soldiers to work on their Springfield rifles, either uh, to tighten or loosen or remove some fouling, um, whatever they needed to clean on their rifles. And this is a mouth harp. Um, an interesting find for me because it shows what the soldiers might have been doing when they weren't in fighting. Uh, not that playing a mouth harp would be the best thing to do in a combat zone, but <laughs> that, that may be why we found it. Maybe it was taken away. <laughs> found a few buttons, not a lot, uh, and they're usually in pretty rough shape because of the acidic soil. Uh, however, this one you can see right along the bottom here, not very evident in the picture, but in real life you can see it says Excelsior, which would have been related to the New York uh, flag. Um, so this was found near the 141st New York, up on the, the summit probably was dropped by a soldier of the 141st. <coughs> now these are belt plates or box plates that we found. We found three, these three. Uh, they're more rare to find. They would have been, the top one is a, a belt buckle. You can tell that by the, the back. It has different connecting points. Um, and the two bottom ones were box plates, and they would have been on the soldier's ammunition box um, that they have, they carried on their belt. And we found three of those. One of them, the top one, was right along the uh, breastworks where the 16th Michigan was. Uh, the, this one was uh, right along Sykes Avenue, uh, not in a place that I expected to find very much, but happened to be a belt plate there. And then the last one we found on the north end, on the east side of Sykes Avenue, kind of back in where the trail is. Now these are some of the maps uh, that we've been making. They're very preliminary. <coughs> Remember, uh, we haven't had time to really analyze all the data yet, and we haven't even gone through all of the parts of the project area yet. Um, But this is just a preliminary view of where the exploded artillery fragments are. And you can see a lot of them are down along the west summit, or the west slope of the hill, which makes sense if that's where they were exploding and falling on the <coughs> soldiers. And then up here there's also more fragments uh, where the um, artillery units would have been, so they might have been trying to hit the caissons or, or uh, take out the artillery that way. <coughs> Here's one showing the fired, unfired, and extracted <coughs> small arms. These would have been the 58 caliber and 69 caliber minis. Um, you can see they're kind of focused in Along, this is where the castle is, and the, the breastworks were, would be all along there. And then down here, you have the breastworks for the 20th Maine. You can really kind of see a pattern there, but again, it's very preliminary. Down here was the Pennsylvania Volunteers. <coughs> We 
focus in more along Chamberlain Avenue. These are just the dropped Gardner uh, bullets. And you can see that they're kind of along the hill slope. That was, that's what we're calling the Texas Trail that goes down from the top down towards Devil's Den. And then up here is uh, where the castle is. And we don't really know why there were gardens there, but we're going to have to do some more research to see if maybe there were prisoners held there or if that was where they put uh, the dropped ammunition. But then down <coughs> along Chamberlain, you can certainly see that there is a, a large number of gar dropped gardener bullets all along the top of the ridge there. And kind of loosely line up with where Oates and Chamberlain said that their lines were. Uh, but again, we need to do some additional investigation to find out exactly why those gardeners are there. This is uh, all of the small arms and the gardeners are in yellow. These are the kinds of things that we look for when we're doing the metal taking and collecting the data. <coughs> As you can see, it's been a lot of metal taking fun. <coughs> and this is the location where the 20th Main would be. And we have actually found one dropped gardener that was underneath the asphalt for Chamberlain Avenue. There's closer in. Yeah, the yellow shows the gardeners. Purple would be all the other small arms. or what we'll end up interpreting it as. And then um, the folks that have been really helping me out there uh, do the metal detecting are Bill Etley and, and Matt Clark, um, the, the volunteers that show up and once or twice a week and help me do the metal detecting. Caitlin and Eric both work for the park. Uh, send it back over to Jeff. <laughs> well, that concludes the slideshow. We're happy to take questions if, if anyone has uh, questions for us. I have one. Have you, in your, when you look, did you find any human remains? Maybe not here, but how about on the Paul Hill? How would you identify that? Do you see rows of buttons? And what do you do if you think you're coming upon a great battle? We have not found any uh, human remains <coughs> in any of the recent projects. Uh, to my knowledge, I, I don't know that human remains have been found here for, for some time in terms of in any of the battlefield uh, archaeology. Keep in mind that the, the metal detector uh, strategy kind of limits that potential in, in that we're mostly targeting near surface deposits and artifacts that are within a few inches of the ground surface and um, we haven't found anything that's sort of indicative of that. Farmsteads, on the farmsteads you do find um, animal bone is not uncommon um, and you generally find more, more buttons obviously uh, but we haven't found anything that we would think would be associated with remains or a grave. Um, an interesting aside is the notion of, of some of the farmhouses being used as field hospitals. And so far, although we have reports, obviously, that several of them were, when we look at the archaeological work that's been done around some of those purported hospitals, we don't see much in the way of, of evidence of that. Uh, Maybe, I think there's a scalpel here or there. Um, if you, the 
buttons, some of the buttons could have come off with uniforms, and things like that, but we have not found any remains um, in recent times. Yes? On your digging, um, oh, do you have a depth that you have found where a lot of the two ringers and the three ringers are found? You make that notation, is that you have any grounds to detect that? Um, it, it really varies a lot depending on where you're at uh, on the hill. Um, some of the places along the 20th Main, the soil has been very uh, degraded there, so those finds are closer to the surface. Uh, but uh, it really depends. Some places, like along that Tux Texas Trail, some of those finds have been deeper because that's where the soil has moved down to as it's gone. go through the asphalt, but until we get the asphalt off, I can't really ground proof it. Uh, so they had to take the asphalt off before I could check what the find was. There was a question. Uh, yeah, um, I have a question, a little bit of a departure from Little Round Top specifically, but if you think about repurposing the battlefield for artillery training during World War One and the kind of ramshackle nature of overriding hallowed ground, and now here you are with a painstaking uh, excavation of this particular area. Did you, did you find any sort of similar, um, you know, extraction the way they did when you're looking out where the Colt Park area was? Uh, you mean in, in terms of uh, later in, in terms of foraging for all kinds of souvenirs and so on, you know, to to sort of have a parallel towards your forensics, if oh, you will. Oh, yeah. Well, um, I, I, th I think in terms of, you know, I alluded to the nails earlier. In terms of post-battle post artifacts, I get Steve to comment on some of the uh, things that he's found out there. I, nothing from, uh, I don't know anything about scavenging or um, uh, much in the way of introduction of Things that would that would sort of obscure our interpretation of the battle. But what are what are some of the stranger things you found out there, or, or more modern, common modern things you found out there? One of the other things, than nails. other than nails, <laughs> that the photo you showed earlier, the Hutchinson stopper, that's uh, we find a lot of bottle glass and uh, we find a lot of modern bottle caps and pull tabs. Uh, and we find railroad spikes. Railroad spikes, <laughs> lots and lots of railroad spikes from either from the electric railroad that went down through the valley, or from there. There, I think there used to be a small hand-operated rail that went from one of the visitor uh, booths up to the top. Uh, we have found uh, World War One and World War Two. Graphs. Uh, most of them were like, fired blanks, uh, 30 out 6 rounds. Uh, we have found some 22s uh, because they used to allow hunting on there on the, the ridge. Uh, just it's usually right on the surface, so the the, the battle-related artifacts would be deeper and. The, Items from the 1920s or 1940s even would be higher up and closer to the surface. Go ahead. Um, have you, um, do you just use uh, metal detectors or have you considered using anything like a ground penetrating radar or anything like that? <coughs> We're just using metal detectors uh, in this project. Uh, <coughs> there has been a consideration of doing GPR in various places, but I, I'm not familiar with how that's gone or with the discussion there. Uh, we haven't used sort of what GPR is what we call remote sensing, uh, there's ground penetrating radar and other techniques. Um, 
magnetometer, soil resistivity, those sorts of things that uh, allow you to kind of see into the ground without excavating. Uh, we haven't done much of that on the park, but we're actually uh, probably going to launch into some of that this summer. We have the Park Service has a team of experts who uh, travel around to different parks in the region, and uh, they're scheduled. Well, not scheduled yet, but we're talking to them about coming this year. That will be more focused on uh, probably some of those battlefield areas around <coughs> the farmsteads themselves. Uh, so with the dual effort of, of looking for old farm features, architectural features that are no longer extant, or possibly uh, something else that's buried as a result of the, the battle. Good question. But it wouldn't really work out at, I don't think it would work out at Little Rock Top because it's just such rocky ground. There's no, no soil to play with out there. Uh, who was next? Sure. Have you found out buttons from units not normally associated with having fought in this area? We haven't really found anything unusual for the buttons. Um, like I said about the Excelsior buttons, um, we also found one that may have a Pennsylvania uh, flag on it. Um, but most of them have just been the, the typical U.S. Uh, federal buttons that we expect to find. Um, there hasn't been anything specific to other units yet. But we, again, we haven't analyzed all of the data yet. Sure, for sure, where they come from or where they go. Up at the top? Yes, uh, the, uh, the photo of the dig at the uh, New York Monument was fascinating. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, two things. I want to know what from that floor that you showed us in the dark dirt, how far was that below the, the bottom of the, uh, of the monument? Uh, it, it was about a about a meter uh, twenty centimeters, one point two meters, so, yeah, four feet. Maybe. Uh, we always use metrics. Uh, so yeah, it was it was quite deep. Now the important thing about that though is that that it was if I can get back to it that was kind of an isolated situation. So um, just. Like that boulder right there, that is in what we call in situ, right? It's in its original position, obviously. Uh, all this is deposited, and you can tell when you take a close look at it. Um, so this is in situ, and then it, so you can kind of follow out, because there's a breastwork right out here. So you can kind of follow out this ground surface to intact ground surface that is exposed out here. So it sort of makes sense. Uh, it's not like all of, of Little Round Top is, is this uh, filled or mounded, but it is in locations, you know, that where monuments were erected or where the Park Service decades ago created trails, there was fill put down, right? And then, a, and then a paved trail put on top of that fill. So that's something we're trying to be mindful of. And we don't want to repeat that. We don't want to put a new layer of fill down without considering what's is there a similar thing uh, expected somewhere between the right and the left flanks on the top of uh, uh, the 20th Main? Um, we, we haven't really talked about doing anything along the, the 20th Main. We did metal detect there um, pretty intensively. Um, I don't know. Because the soil was so deflated there and degraded from erosion, I don't know if you would have the same type of fill profile that you do at the 44. Uh, but we, we have identified a couple other locations where we think this might um, also occur on Little Round Top. So we're going we're gonna to try to check those out before, again, before the project is <laughs> How long has the Park Service been documenting what they've been finding on here as they've been moving earth or changing the landscape? 
you mean a little round top or, or in general? Park lot. Um, for, I've only been here three months. <laughs> but, um, I was looking for something longer. <laughs> at least the last three months. No, um, as far as far as I can tell, uh, archaeology here has been it's been practiced for decades. We have going back to the um, 1980s. Uh, the largest archaeological project that I'm aware of, believe it or not, occurred in relation to uh, the installation of sewer lines. The most, the most excavation that's ever been done at once was in association with that. So there was a, a large scale project to install sewer lines across the park at different locations, and archaeology was done in most of those locations, if not all. Um, so that was, that was a pretty big deal. That was in the late 90s, I think. Um, but yeah, it's been done for a while. Uh, the battlefield archaeology, I think, has increased especially as our ability to use G, uh, GPS and GIS has really evolved. Yes? <laughs> Where and when will what you found be um, displayed for the public? Well, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. um, if, if, if we can make it happen, I would love to. Ultimately, it, it won't be in the immediate future, but I think the ability to, to tell mm -hmm. Our ability to create the, a kind of exhibit that tells a story like this, that's location specific and battle specific. Um, I hear you. I, I, I think that's something that we should work towards. I don't know when we'll get, get that done, but whether it's, it's a physical and or virtual um, exhibit. Uh, that's why we're doing this today, though, <coughs> and, is to share, and this is very preliminary, so it's, it's kind of, you know, we're throwing some stuff out there, but we, we have a lot of work to do. Um, but I think that's a, that's a great point and something we want to work towards, not just with the battle, but with those farmsteads too, because there, there are interesting stories before and after the battle um, about 19th century you know, agrarian life here in Adams County. Yes, I think I've been missing you. It's a really basic question, but can you always tell the difference between a spent mini ball and one like one that's been fired and one that hasn't. Mostly you can. Uh, I'll show you the, the pictures. Maybe there we go. So these are, they're they're very intact and don't have a lot of markings on them. Uh, you can see on the the dancing park that there's a, a big dent. Then these are the fired ones, and they really they they look like a wad of chewing gum when you find them in the ground. They they've been impacted and deformed a lot. So it seems like you found a lot that weren't fired. I mean, at least from the pictures. And Absolutely. Fewer that were. So does you draw any conclusions from that? Um. Well, we we're trying not to make any hard conclusions yet because we haven't looked at everything, but. One of the things that we've kind of thought about was that maybe a lot of the fired rounds were overshots and they're in the, down the hill on the east side of the parking area where we haven't really gone into and that may be more impacted by the filling and cutting and filling for Sykes Avenue. So uh, it could be that they just have gone over and we've only done that one uh, area for the Texas Trail down the west slope, so there could be a lot more fired grounds in there. Um, some of the breastworks we found uh, fired bullets kind of in the, the rocks of the breastworks. Um, uh, but a lot, of, a lot more of those have been the dropped, and that just indicates you know soldiers were in place there. And a lot of the breastworks also, Jim Rowan made a point to say that a lot of those breastworks were built on the second and third day of the battle, not, not there when everything was at its highest. Uh, go ahead, Ray The uh, fill under the 44th monument, um, 
under the footings and the base of the monument, do you find it to be stable? I'm not an engineer, <laughs> so I'm not going to say definitively that it was stable, but uh, it, it did, it was well compacted. Well, the monument's very large and it weighs a lot. Right. Um, and there were some voids in there, but uh, the construction folks have addressed that and they, they're all aware of it. Yeah. Tell us it's <laughs> Building, building upon some of the answers you've given already, uh, and your initial uh, presentation said that you've only been working in the areas to this point related to the um, rehabilitation. So, therefore, are there plans to go beyond this rehabilitation work to go into some of the other areas that you were just talking about? At Little Round Top, no, there are, there are no plans at, at present. Um, we're, we're focused on this. This project's still evolving itself. So um, the, that polygon that I showed you earlier that sort of en encompasses the um, all of the trails and all the components of the project, we may, we may expand work within that polygon. And there's, I guess, some potential for that to get expanded, but unlikely. Um, mm. I did mention that I think there's there are a couple of other phases of work out here, one of which was done back in 2017 as part of the planning for a controlled burn out there. Yeah. But that one, that went a little bit beyond um, the current study area. But otherwise, no, we're, we're really limiting ourselves to that, that project area at, at present. <coughs> Well, there'll, there'll be a report. Uh, most of those reports are, are technical reports, and, and under the uh, federal law, they're they're considered confidential information. So they, we, we, the technical, <laughs> the technical, uh, <laughs> I'm not gonna make a joke. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the we can prepare uh, sort of a different version of that report. So in other words, it's not uncommon to have like the technical report that has all the nitty gritty details and then a public version of that report. So we can produce, much like, I don't know if you've seen it, but um, there are other, other battlefield archaeology re public reports have come out and we could do something like that. The technical report is, would be so full of uh, technical jargon and appendices, you wouldn't want to read that anymore. <laughs> so, uh, we'll produce the, a public version and then the, the boring technical one, too. <laughs> okay. So, I have a question. The, uh, the field dirt they used for the man when they built that monument, um, I would assume that they just strike that up from nearby and built the man with it, if there's no record of it. I assume it was local, yes. Yeah. So, if your question is, could, could the artifacts be kind of redeposited? That's certainly possible. I think we're going to take one more question from that gentleman. With the ongoing work at Devil's Den, have you conducted similar uh, research? Yes, there's been work conducted at Devil's Den and Devil's Kitchen. I think I showed a map earlier of the Devil's Kitchen area. Um, well, we'll have to save that for another, <laughs> for another presentation. Um, yeah. It's, uh, well, no, we, in fact, this was, uh, this was shared in another presentation, um, I think, not, I can't remember when, by uh, Caitlin, who's not with us today. She's the other archaeologist on the park. But we could share this one as another presentation. This one's more or less done, whereas Little Round Top is kind of just in process. So we could share another presentation on uh, Devil's Den, Devil's Kitchen areas uh, in a separate venue. Yeah. Yeah.